Hey guys, Landon here with uh, Boomsies and Substance TV. Uh, as you know, there is no Boomsies this week. Brian's wife, it's her birthday, so happy birthday to her. Brian will be spending some time with her uh, on Saturday night, so no Boomsies. Uh, but in the meantime, I figured uh, I'm bored, so I might as well go ahead and release a video. Uh, kind of just letting you guys know what I've been up to this week in the same structure that we normally do on Boomsies. Uh, so might as well just jump right in. The first thing that I've been doing this week is continuing, excuse me, continuing to play Final Fantasy XIII 2. I really, actually I'm really enjoying this game. I, granted, I did enjoy 13, which I know a lot of people didn't, didn't really like a lot. Um, for the most part, I think if you didn't care for 13, but you are a Final Fantasy fan, you, you should at least try 13 2. Uh, you don't necessarily have to have played 13 to really grasp the story, so you can really just jump right in. Um, it kind of recaps it, and you'll, you'll be fine if you haven't played 13, is basically what I'm getting at. But um, if you did, hey, cool, jump right in. Uh, they did fix a lot of the issues from 13, but uh, I will say this. Uh, I said it in the last issue of Boomsies. If you hated Paradigm Systems from 13, they're still here in 13.2, so that base structure of Paradigm Systems is still here, so if you hated it, unfortunately it's still here, deal with it, uh, or just don't play the game. Um, other than that though, they did fix a lot of issues, it seems like Square listened to the fans. Uh, the biggest issue that I heard, and really that I kind of had with 13, was the linearity. With 13.2, you're doing a lot of time traveling, and it they really broke open the linearity, so you're able to not only travel from place to place whenever you want, however you want, um, but then just basically the structure of each level is very much non-linear. There's a lot of places for you to go and travel and, and explore and find hidden areas. Square did a really good job of hiding items throughout this uh, throughout the game. You have a little companion, a little Moogle, uh, that you can actually use to find different treasure chests so they might be hidden, kind of see-through-esque. Uh, throughout the game, so you use your Moogle, he'll do his Moogle hunt and you can find items. So um, you definitely kind of get that hunting back that you kind of missed from previous Final Fantasies of exploring. Um, characters are very unique. Um, you, it follows the story of um, Noel and Sarah. Noel is a new character. Sarah is a returning character from Final Fantasy XIII. A non-playable returning character, mind you. Um, so you follow them and it's, it's their story. Um, the other really cool, uh, unique addition to Final Fantasy XIII 2 is essentially Pokemon. They've, they've added this uh, monster capturing uh, technique in the game that it's, it's taking what for me is already an addicting series of Final Fantasy um, in this game I find addicting. Um, but then you're throwing in a whole other addictive, extremely addictive game genre type into the series, Pokemon. Um, essentially, as you're battling throughout uh, the game, you run into different monsters, obviously, and when you defeat them, you have a chance of them turning into crystal. Once they turn into crystal, they can join your party, and you can battle with them. You can level them up as well. You Essentially, you can have uh, three different monsters in your paradigm pack, but you can only use one at a time. Um, throughout the whole game, you basically use the two characters, Sarah, uh, Sarah and Noel. So you've got your two characters there, and then on top of that, you have your one extra uh, monster that will be within your party. Um, but like I said, you'll have two other backups, so you can switch them out. Each monster has their own specific role to play. In Final Fantasy 13 and 13 2, you've got different character classes of a commando, strength based, uh, ravengers, you know, magic based, uh, you've got your medics, and basically that, that kind of structure. And your main characters can use uh, can learn multiple different abilities within those those roles. Your monsters basically stick to one role, so you kind of need to utilize them and create your own paradigm packs based on whatever fight you're going to get into. And like I said, you can level your character, your your monsters up, which is nice. It goes back to the Pokemon. You you earn your Pokemon, you can level them up and train them. Uh, they reach a level. Each one kind of reaches their different level caps. But here's the kicker for me, which makes it even more addicting to me. I've I've essentially stopped the story where I'm at because now I'm I'm on this quest. I have to basically have every pokey or uh, every excuse me every chocobo in the game. Uh, I, the first chocobo I caught was just the regular regular chocobo, not a color to it. I mean it's yellow, but just just regular chocobo. Caught that and I was like, I had no idea that you could capture cho chocobos and have them fight with you, and I was like. 
Yes, that is amazing. I have to do this. I have to gather, uh, capture all the all the chocobos. So now I've got the red chocobo and I've got the blue chocobo. Um, red is a commando, blue is a ravenger. And so now my quest, I got to go get the, the gold, the silver, black, the blue. Uh, well, I've got the blue. There's green. I don't know. I, I, that, basically, my quest right now is just to gather all of the chocobos. So that's where this addictive personality comes into play. So, like I said, it, it, it's worth trying just for that. Um, also, I mean, it, it's not perfect though. There are some complaints that I do have with 13.2, um, mainly the non-threatening antagonist. The 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 main antagonist in this game, I, I just don't really feel threatened by him. It, it, it does it doesn't where I'm at in the game. There's no real feeling of impending doom upon the earth. No real drive for me to continue the story in that aspect of a threatening bad guy in the game which basically every previous Final Fantasy has a, a great great villain uh, this one I don't really feel that way I do feel the need to continue the story for other reasons to try and save lightning and, and uh, save the planet for other reasons other than this villain if that makes sense. Uh, so that, and that might change, like I said, I haven't beat the game. Um, I've put in quite a few hours just, but basically doing a lot of it, just gathering truck posts. Um, so that might change, my opinion might change. Uh, so obviously I'm gonna continue playing this. Um, so like I said, I, I would recommend it if you've never tried, uh, I mean, if you tried 13 and you weren't a fan, this is definitely enough of a departure that I think you should at least try it out. Um, so, like, I was, it, it's nice because they listen to their fans, they listen to the complaints to a degree. I was having a conversation with a friend today, um, and basically, it was, I, I had said that it's nice when developers listen to the, the players, the gamers, and adjust their games accordingly, and he was like, well, that could always go bad, too, because then essentially, you're listening to everybody, and you're compiling all these ideas together, and then eventually you just get the same game, everything's the same game. I'm like, well, yeah, I, I see that, but that's not exactly what I was saying, I was... Basically, it's, it's nice for developers to listen to fans to a degree uh, without losing the core f fundamentals of the game that you set out to create, and that's where what I think Final Fantasy did. I mean, you still have the paradigm system, you still have the base structure of how the game plays, but you've adjusted the things that are adjustable and still keep within the same vision that you had before. And I think this is essentially what 13 should have been, um, this dynamic with 13 story, which would have been great. So, give it a shot. The other thing that I've been up to this week and uh, don't yell at me too quickly, but I, a friend of mine at work let me borrow Transformers Dark of the Moon, uh, the Blu-ray 3D, the regular Blu-ray DVD and digital copy uh, version. So I watched that and quite honestly, I, I saw the first Transformers and I saw the second Transformers and I skipped past this one just because the second Transformers scarred me. I'm like, I don't really want to continue in this franchise. Um, but I've been told by multiple people that this one is much better than the second one. It's not quite as good as the first, but um, drastically, drastically better than the, than the second. And after watching it, I pretty much have to agree. Um, the first act, though, this movie's been out for a while, so there might be some spoilers, I'm sorry. But um, the first half of this movie, all the lead up, there's a lot of really cool, um, I don't know, conspiracy theory type stuff with uh, the moon landing and stuff and that's all interesting but it felt so dragged out it seemed like it took an hour this movie was just seemed way too long and I think a lot of that came with the opening act the opening half of, of the film I think if you were to cut that down to even just a quarter of the length that it was it would have made the rest of the film so much better so I was watching and I was enjoying it kind of leaning back just, just enjoying it not really loving the film to that point but then you've got uh, the character Sentinel Prime, which is essentially Optimus Prime's mentor, uh, when he was when he was training back on Cybertron, uh, they find him. He they awaken him, and he becomes part of the story. When he here's the spoiler, so turn away if if you don't want to hear the spoilers. If you haven't seen this film, when he goes bad, when he turns and betrays the Autobots, that is when the movie gets good. That is when uh, the action ramps up, and it actually becomes interesting. Not to say that it wasn't interesting before; it was just kind of dull and dragged out. At this point, it really ramps up and I was really engaged with this film. Um, the combat was really solid. It it gave reasons for everything. Optimus Prime, now he's got his his big trailer to to his truck, you know, his, his vehicle form, which that trailer transforms into his arsenal so he gets, you know, his upgraded weapons, his, his sword and his shield and et cetera, et cetera. Um, got some really great battles at the end of it. You know, not a bad film at the second half, 
Um, so worth watching. The, the very last scene, uh, again, spoiler alert, so, uh, you know, turn away. Um, at the very end, when he basically decapitates Megatron and then leaves the axe in his head, that felt a little out of character for Optimus Prime. It was cool, don't get me wrong, it was cool. All for that shit, but um, it felt out of character. And then at the end, uh, Sentinel Prime is like begging for mercy, essentially, and Optimus Prime just pulls out the their version of a shotgun, basically, she just shoots him in the face. And that whole that whole last like three minutes of that that scene there just was like, whoa, that just doesn't seem like the good guy Optimus Prime is supposed to be. Uh, but still, a good film at the end of it. it I would say it's worth watching. Um, the Blu-ray edition here is jam-packed full of uh, bonus features. A whole, whole extra Blu-ray full of bonus features. And some of it is very entertaining. There's uh, there's like an hour, hour and a half long documentary on, on NASA, which is really interesting if you're into that stuff. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Um, but... <laughs> there is one behind the scenes when they're kind of just doing just an overall behind the scenes not very specific behind the scenes but just overall talking about the concepts how they were building up um, towards this third movie they basically they admit that the second movie was terrible everybody on the set admits that the second movie was awful and they really kind of needed to improve and change things so awesome it's good that they realized that the second movie was, was trash uh, but obviously now Megan Fox is no longer in this third film uh, she had a big squabble with uh, Michael Bay, the director, and, and she's no longer in this franchise, and they've got this new lady, and during, when they're just kind of talking behind the scenes, Michael Bay kind of is doing these backhanded compliments uh, about the new girl, but at the same time just trashing Megan Fox, just really subtle things, basically complimenting her, saying like, oh yeah, it was it was so nice having, uh, you know, once she came on onto the set, just to say hi and, and be so happy and, and nice to see you guys, it was just a real nice change of pace. and. It's just like that multiple, multiple times, just Michael Bay just saying nice things about her, but clearly just trashing Megan Fox. So it's pretty entertaining just for that. That's that's worth watching this. Um, so like I said, I think it's it's an okay film. This one's worth watching. The, the opening like hour though, God, far too long just dragged out. This whole movie was really long. I started at like 9.30 at night. I wasn't done till midnight. I'm like, shit, this is way longer than it needs to be. Kind of like this video is going on. I'm just dragging it on. Um, so anyways, in a nutshell, that's, that's what I've been up to this week. Uh, you know, thanks for watching. Uh, next week there will be a Boomsies. We'll be back to normal schedule. So as always, check us out. We're on Facebook. Just search Substance TV. Uh, we're on there. Like us. Brian and I bicker all the time on, uh, on Facebook. Also check out our website, substance-tv.com. We post all types of articles, uh, some fun videos, obviously all of our Boomsies is on there. Um, and then follow us on YouTube or on iTunes as well. So thanks for watching. See ya.